with the wireless mic um, working? If for some reason that's not working. Okay. Sorry. Cool. Uh, okay, so this will be a little bit improvised. I'll just stand over here. <laughs> uh, cool. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm James Douglas, in case you don't know me. Uh, today, we're talking about uh, some of the lessons that uh, we've learned at my company, Versal, about uh, using functional programming in actual production code. Um, can you hear me all right? Do I need the mic? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. Okay. Uh, all right, I guess this is the thing. Um, cool. So, uh, as I was saying, I, I will share some of the lessons that we've learned uh, implementing functional programming uh, at work. Um, I've, I've often found that a lot of the uh, functional programming articles and, and blog entries and things out there uh, are fascinating, but sometimes hard to connect to uh, actual code that you might write for money uh, during the day. So. Um, but it, it turns out that they're actually uh, totally applicable uh, and, and actually really useful um, uh, at your job. So that's basically um, the, the goal of this talk is to, to connect those two worlds. Uh, and so the motivation uh, behind all of this is that, uh, generally speaking, there are all these cool characteristics of functional programming that uh, it, that is often promised. So things like uh, making our code safe or, or type safe. Um, Composable. What does that mean? How do we put pieces of our code together uh, from smaller components? Um, reusability. That's kind of the same same idea. Uh, and I, I submit that functional programming can make all of these things happen. Happen. Um, and there's an asterisk there. I'm going to define what I mean by functional programming in the context of this talk um, on the next slide. Um, and then I will go through kind of a simple uh, real world uh, example of. Um, how this actually works. And again, there's I need to define real world. Um, and by the way, if any of you like JavaScript, this is an adaptation of a JavaScript version of this talk that I did. Uh, it makes way more sense in Scala because uh, functional programming and uh, strong types go uh, very well together, especially when you start getting into monadic design. Okay, so by functional programming, in this case, I basically mean referential transparency. Um, who here? is comfortable with that term and uh, doesn't need any further uh, uh, definition. Okay, so um, the majority of you uh, uh, are where I was very, uh, not too long ago. Um, referential transparency, uh, in a nutshell, that means um, uh, it's similar to idempotency, in case you're familiar with that term. Uh, but basically it means that anywhere in your code, um, the, the, the reference to any function invocation, like uh, foo of bar uh, will eventually, when run, yield some result, baz, right? And anywhere in your code, uh, when you see foo of bar, uh, you could replace it with baz. You could replace any function invocation with its result, and it doesn't change the semantic meaning of your code. Uh, and so a really simple example of that to sort of solidify this is, imagine you have a function that adds two numbers, like add takes x and y and returns x plus y, but also in your function body, you you print something to the screen. So you say, hey, I'm printing, or I'm adding x and y, and here's the result, and then it returns. Um, that function would not be referential transparent, because uh, in, in an example usage, you might have um, you know, val x equals add of 1 and 2, and so the result of that function call is 3. But it also has this extra little side effect where it's printing to the screen. So if you were to go through that code and replace all of those um, function calls with just 3, uh, your code is actually different now because those print lens are no longer happening. Um, so with referential transparency, we, we disallow this. And um, this opens up lots of nice doors for us because when we see a function call, uh, we know that it means exactly its output and nothing more. And then when I say real world, I mean not real world. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, the, the actual um, uh, implementation that we're using of the state monad, which is what I'm going to cover, uh, is really the state transformer monad with the either monad and then some other free monad types that we have. So it's this really nasty thing that would be extremely difficult to uh, demonstrate on slide. So I've, I've sort of picked that away, and I think I've made a real-world-esque example that's not too contrived, um, and can, you can hopefully connect to your day-to-day uh, -day work. So th this hopefully not too contrived problem is an ATM. Uh, so with a very simple uh, ATM, um, 
specification, we would want users to be able to do a few things. Check their balance, uh, deposit money, and withdraw money. Uh, and possibly charging a fee when they withdraw. <coughs> and so I know ATM examples are used all the time and they get kind of annoying, but uh, and it's not too exciting, but it's actually uh, pretty useful for this example um, because, uh, as I said, we're going to be talking about state, and in an ATM, the handling of state is pretty important. Uh, you don't want to uh, lose transactions, for example, or have extra transactions that you didn't expect. So for our, again, this is a really simple uh, example for the sake of showing it on slides. So the uh, data type for a bank account will just be a sequence of transactions that have occurred. And a transaction is just a number. Uh, so it would be plus for a deposit and negative for uh, a withdrawal. And so you can describe a bank account as the sequence of all transactions that have happened over time. So uh, my first transaction was to deposit $20 to open the account. Uh, and then yesterday I deposited another $20, and today I withdrew $40 or, or whatever. And so my account would be 2020 minus 40. Uh, pretty simple. Okay, and so I think uh, before I jump into the um, functional solution, I want to start with the imperative problem. Uh, so here's sort of a typical way to think about uh, mutable state. Um, this is very imperative code, and, and I'm sure we've all written this code. Certainly I have. Uh, but we have a, an account variable, so it's this mutable reference account, and it's just it's an account, so it's a list of floats in our, our uh, design. Uh, and then we have two functions that manipulate this reference. So we can deposit money, which means we uh, create a new list with one extra value and just replace the reference. Uh, and we withdraw money, which means we also create a new list, also with a new value. In this case, it's a negative. Uh, and then replace the account reference. Uh, and so uh, the reason that, well, so this approach uh, is fine in small scales like this. Um, it's very easy to read and kind of understand. Um, it's very easy to think about in, in terms of uh, data changing over time, which is sort of how we interact with the world. Uh, but it has some problems. Uh, the, the main problem is this var account. It's, it's a mutable reference, um, so it can change at any given time. Um, if you think about a system with multiple threads and lots of things going on at any given time, uh, there might be lots of people accessing this account variable, uh, and you don't necessarily know um, that it's going to be up to date. Somebody could be creating a deposit at the same time that you're creating withdrawal, and what does that mean? How do you resolve those two things happening at the same time? Um, even worse, if you were to call deposit and withdraw at the same time, uh, most likely one of those functions would overwrite the account uh, that the other one created, right? So let's say I, I call deposit and I add $100 to the account. Uh, and then while that's running, I also call withdraw and withdraw $100. Well, withdraw, if deposit has not completed before withdraw begins, uh, withdraw will get an old version of that account. Uh, it will get basically the account that does not yet have that $100 uh, added. And so uh, we're going to have some problems. Um, and furthermore, when deposit overwrites that variable with the new account that has the new data in it, uh, it's likely that withdrawal will finish after that and overwrite it again with missing data. Uh, so it's a big problem. Uh, also, this, so that's kind of mutability and inconsistency. Uh, but then this middle bullet imperative, um, what I mean by this is that anywhere in your code, um, if you're using deposit or withdraw uh, these functions, um, as soon as you use them, basically they get executed, right? So there's no way to abstractly refer to a deposit or refer to a withdrawal as sort of a contractual thing that, that should happen in some order, in some context, um, without actually making the withdrawal happen. So for example, if I have another function that's trying to combine these two, like maybe we have a function that deposits and then immediately makes a smaller withdrawal, uh, that function would, would directly call these two functions, and so we'd have uh, state mutation uh, during the invocation of that uh, combined function. Um, and as we'll see with uh, some FP, uh, that's not necessarily something that we want. So that was state change as a side effect. Um, now, uh, if we switch gears a little bit, we can think of state change as more of a computational effect. Uh, in, in other words, uh, think about state change in terms of uh, a description of how to change some state given some state that we can change. Um, 
So forget about that global uh, account variable. Uh, we don't have access to that anymore. Um, so without that, how can we describe um, deposits and withdrawals? Well, uh, we can just write functions that say, should have brought a laser pointer, that say, given an account, uh, some list of floats, the way we would make a deposit is to uh, produce a new account where we've uh, appended that deposit. And then also, just for convenience, we will uh, include the um, amount, um, the, the balance of the account. And actually, there's an, a nice little error in this code uh, where I'm computing the sum of the old account before the deposit. Um, oops. <laughs> but pretend I'm not doing that. Uh, and so when, when you make a call to this uh, deposit function, you pass in a, an amount to deposit. And the result is not, there, there's been no change. Actually, nothing has really happened. The result is just uh, a continuation. It's a function that uh, once, uh, that at the right time, when you have an account on which to operate, uh, you can execute that function and then get your uh, modified account out of it. Uh, and by the way, uh, this uh, colon plus operator uh, returns a new copy of a list with an, a value appended. So we're not actually mutating the incoming uh, list of floats. And then withdraw is the exact same thing, and it has the exact same error because I copy and paste it. Um, but basically, when we call withdraw and we provide it an amount, the return value of that invocation is just a function that says, uh, when you have an account ready to withdraw from, pass it to me, and I'll make the withdrawal and give you the new balance. So the improvements over uh, our previous uh, issues that we were talking about is we have immutability here. So there are no VARs. Uh, there's no worry about contention for a mutable reference. Uh, we're not using any mutable data structures. We weren't in the previous example, but uh, we're still not, so that's good. Um, and everything is nice and declarative. And by that, I mean when we refer to deposit and withdraw, we're referring to these sort of abstract functions that have not really yet run. Um, deposits and withdrawals are sort of descriptions of computations to carry out uh, once we have an, an account on which to run them. Uh, and this is consistent uh, in that anytime you see a reference to account, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, that data having changed uh, over time. So these are immutable values. You can pass them along to anybody, and you never have to worry about uh, any kind of unexpected inconsistent behavior. These things can run in any order, essentially, uh, and the references are all um, unchanged. Okay, so. Let's, uh, let's start to encode this into um, a data structure that we can use. So we'll call this a state action. A state action is essentially just a function. We're calling this function run that given some kind of state, uh, and in this case, a state will be an account. So it will be a list of transactions, a list of floats. Given some state, uh, we'll do some kind of computation, <coughs> and then we'll produce some kind of output, some interesting value, uh, like the sum of the account. Uh, and then also we'll produce a new state. So this function has the shape, uh, it inputs some arbitrary s, uh, which is the type of our state, and it outputs a tuple containing some interesting value of type a, uh, and then a new um, state of the same type. Uh, this is pretty easy to compose with pure functions. Um, maybe I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but uh, it will, it will become very useful to um, have a state action which produces some a, uh, and then have a function that knows how to turn an a into a b for some arbitrary a and b, uh, and then compose them together. So for example, let's say, let's say we have a uh, state action um, check balance. And all it really does is take the state, take the account information, compute the balance, and then return the balance, and then the exact same account information, because no state has changed uh, in checking the balance. Uh, and the balance comes back in dollars, maybe. Um, and then we might have another function that converts dollars into Bitcoin. So it doesn't really care about the state of your account. It's just some pure conversion function that, you know, given USD, outputs BTC. Uh, in, in this case, in this slide, that dollar to Bitcoin conversion would be our F function. So what we want to say is we have some state action called check balance. Uh, we want that state action to run and then convert the, the result into Bitcoin. So we're going to map over that state action. And this is identical to mapping over a list or an option or you know anything, any other functor-like structure that you might have. 
Uh, and the way it works is we run our, our state function. So that means, given a state, we execute our run function. Oh, geez. We execute our run function. And so that produces our tuple A and, and new state S. Given that A and new state S, here, we're going to run our peer function on A. So we're converting A, which is dollars, into B, which is Bitcoin. Uh, and then we're also going to just pass along that exact same S because our, our peer function has not changed the state of the account. It doesn't cost anything to uh, change the units of your withdrawal. Uh, by the way, this is there's a lot of code here and there's a lot to parse, so don't get too tied up in it. Um, and please feel free to stop me with any questions or clarifications or bugs. Okay. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, also, to clean up some of the syntax, I'm defining this type alias transaction. Uh, I'm saying a transaction is a special kind of state where, uh, it, sorry, it's a special kind of state action where the type of our state is a list of floats. So a transaction of A is a state action that always operates on this list of float type. It's this account data type. And then returns, when, when the state action returns, it will include some type A. So for example, checking the balance is a transaction of type float. So what that means is it's a state action where the input is a list of floats. Let me go back to, yeah. So it's a state action just like this, where our input S is a list of floats, so that's our account. And our output is A and S. So A here is float. So the, the output is the balance, which has a type float. Uh, and then also includes a state, uh, which is the account itself. And this one's really simple. So we construct it with a new state. Uh, this is a case class, so we're just calling the state.apply function. Uh, and, and then this is our run definition. So run says, I take an account, which is a list of floats, and I return a tuple containing the sum of that account and just the account. So this is a uh, state action. It's not very interesting because it's not changing any state, uh, but it is following the contract that we've set up. Oh, and here's here's a uh, slightly different example. We're not converting to Bitcoin here. Uh, getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, so we have another function. This is a pure function called uh, report, where we're taking an, uh, a, a balance, which is a float, and then just turning it into a nice string that we can print. So your balance is whatever. Uh, and so the, the purpose of this is to demonstrate that here's our function uh, f, which goes from float to string. And we can map this function over our balance state action. Uh, and this produces a new state action. So the type of report is a transaction of string. Uh, so to quickly recap, it balance is a transaction of float, meaning it's a state action that, given an account, produces the sum of the account and then just parrots back the account. Um, report is a transaction of string. So that means that given an account, it will run, uh, and then it will return this string saying your balance is whatever, uh, and then it passes right along the account uh, unchanged. Why did you choose to use that list combination? Doesn't look like that there's before. Like where well, TX. Okay. Uh, where do you see that? TX of A is, is the, the state, and the TX of A is like a state of uh, list of things. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the pair here? Yes. Okay. So when we say a TX of A, so type aliases are, uh, they're just convenience. They're, they're, uh, these things are exactly identical to the compiler. So uh, it just makes the syntax a little cleaner. So what we're saying is a TX of A is just a thing that we're inventing. Uh, it's just a shortcut for saying state of list of float of A. And if we go back to this slide, state of list of float of A means uh, S is a list of float. So that means any time uh, that we create a TX, we're really creating a state, but we're guaranteed that this S is always list of float. Okay, no problem. Okay, so that's composition with pure functions. Uh, not super useful um, without uh, being able to compose with other state actions, or really functions that operate on a state and produce a new state action. So this is almost the same, but tricky enough that we should probably step through it. Um, but the idea is, just like before, let me go back. 
So before we have a state action that returns an A, uh, and we're defining a way to convert that A into a B. Pretty straightforward. Now, we still have a state action that returns an A, uh, but we're defining a way to convert that A into a new state action uh, and get a, get a state action of the same type. So this is, again, just like list.flatmap or option.flatmap or anything.flatmap that you, you've seen. Um, what we want to avoid is having a state of S <coughs> of state of S of B. Um, so it's sort of like mapping and then squashing it back into just a single state action. And the way this works is very similar. So we're cr we construct a new state action uh, whose run function is defined by running this run function, right? So that goes from F S to AS. Once we have that A and S, we uh, compose it with this function. So we take the A and the S, we run F of A, and that's this function here. So now F of A gives us a state of SB. And remember, a state of SB just looks like this. So it's got its own run function for, uh, where S goes to BS. So this is a state of SB. So we simply call its run function and pass along this S uh, that, that came out. Uh, understanding this line is really not that important for the purpose of this talk, which is showing how we can compose these things. So don't worry too much about it. Um, but the, the point is we can take a state action and compose it with a function that looks like this to get a type that looks like that. So state, uh, excuse me, is a, is a pair. Is that structure, right? It has only two things. And it sounds like the, the second one is the account itself every time. Is that, is this a coincidence or is this something that we have thoughtfully to be able to just make, make map, flat map? This is not a coincidence. We were very intentionally designing the, the shape of state to be a function from S to A and S. Uh, and so map and flat map must be written such that the types come out uh, in the same way. Uh, are you wondering about the tuple that comes out of the run function? Yes. Okay, so the, the choice seemed like very important to have all this machinery work. Yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure I follow, but let me let me describe this function again, and maybe maybe it'll clarify. Uh, so the the whole purpose of this run function is so that we can describe how, given an initial state, we can run some computation and then produce new state. And so, one thing that's implied but maybe not explicit in the type is that that incoming state is not changing. It's an immutable data structure. And what comes out is some interesting value, some A, that is the result of our computation. And also, a new, uh, uh, basically the state that is has now replaced what you passed into that function. So it, it doesn't modify the, the variable that's coming in, but it has the same type and it could be potentially different. So for example, if, uh, if this is describing uh, a, a deposit, let me go back to that slide. So to describe a, a deposit as a state, we need a, an account into which we're depositing money. Um, and then we produce this tuple that includes the balance of the account. In this case, it's before the deposit. It should be after the deposit. Uh, and then also it includes the new account. So this is, this is saying, uh, if you start with the, this incoming state, here called account, and you run this function, then you this account basically becomes history. It, it's it's no longer the the um, current state of reality. Um, instead, this account, so account plus the, the you know with this value appended to it, this is the new account. So this is the state that has replaced um, this state. Um, but what we haven't done anywhere is done that replacement. So like nowhere have we said uh, var my account equals new list and then run this thing and, and it, we're, like we're not replacing that var yet. We'll, we'll get there. Um, but this is just meant to describe how a stateful function runs and give you a handle to the new state uh, so that you can forget about the old state. And then so when we implement map and flat map, uh, that allows us to tack on another function uh, that will run this whole thing 
and thread this state along as it potentially changes uh, so that we can still treat this this new composition as a single state action and we don't have to worry about the intermediate steps uh, so that state is, is automatically passed through um, and then one just one more uh, sort of um, example of this is here when we flat map so when we when we flat map uh, just like before we're not actually doing any computation just like with the deposit function all we're doing is describing a state action uh, in this case we're starting with the outer state action which again is just a description of a computation to run and we're <coughs> saying okay someday in the future when this thing finally does run we want to take the output which is a and also the potent, the new state so that the new account with maybe extra data in it we want to take those after this run and then pass them in, into this function in a way that we can get uh, a b and a new a new new state out of it um, and so the way we do that is we run f of a to get a state of sb so at, at this point we've got a state floating around from running uh, this one <coughs> and we have a state of SB which itself has a, a run function that needs a state uh, and then produces a tuple so uh, we'll finally need to run uh, the, the that state's run function and provide um, the intermediate S so S is going through sort of two iterations here we have this outer S that's coming into the outer run function here and then it's getting passed along finally to this inner state of SB. Does that make sense? Maybe. Uh, it's really tricky. It's it's not. Um, it's definitely not clear just from looking at this for the first time. Um, I I had to basically implement it myself and and make it work, um, get it to compile to sort of really solidify exactly how these things are are kind of flowing through each other. Yeah, one last question. The S that we passed to the last function there, dot run S, yeah. it is the changed S or the original S? Uh, that's a good question. So it, because I'm using this and then syntax, it's a, not quite clear. Um, it is the, it's the second S. So it's the S that comes out of running this first run function. So because of the way this and then works, uh, what we're saying is uh, we would take run, which is this one, and we would run it. So this is, imagine that there's, an initial s like s not coming into this function we run s not and the output of that is an a and s1 right then given that a and s1 we will run f of a and then on the output of that is a state so uh, we get its run function and we run with s1 so uh, we're creating a new state that when run is kind of giving us an S2. So we went from S0 all the way to S2. So just like a couple steps you know, in the middle. So here's an example. Um, hopefully this will help illustrate and, and not be too uh, obtuse. Um, so again, here's a, a deduct function. And uh, we're saying deduct is a function that given an amount to deduct, will return a transaction. And remember, a transaction is just a state where we're locking down S to always be a list of floats. <coughs> the way we construct this is we build a new state, and we define its run function as a function that takes an account and checks, is the balance of the account more than the amount that we're deducting? And if so, we return the amount deducted and then a new account where we're appending uh, this amount deducted from the account. Um, otherwise, if, if the sum of the account, if the balance of the account is not sufficient to withdraw this money, we simply return a tuple that says, hey, nothing was withdrawn, and here's your account unchanged. Um, and so again, when I, other, other uh, elsewhere in my code, when I am invoking deduct and passing it a value, pass, you know, deduct of 10, um, nothing gets deducted yet. All we return is a new state action that has this description. So it's a state action that once we finally give it an account, it will know how to maybe deduct from that account if the funds are sufficient. But because maybe, could you, could you discuss how you can include like maybe or email or something? Sure, let, let's save that to the end though. Uh, that's a, a good question. So the question is how can we combine this with maybe um, so that our type, uh, rather than having this if else and we just return uh, the amount deducted or zero, 
maybe we could return uh, an either where one of our values is the deduction and the other value is some kind of error, like, hey, you don't have enough funds or something like that. Is that the thing to zero to the might like C, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, in in practice, I'm we are using this directly in conjunction with either, um, but it I mean this this simple example is still like pretty tricky uh, just to parse from a slide, um, but yeah, I'd be happy to, to go into that afterward. Okay, so let's look at how we can use a state action with flat map. So with flat map, we need a function that takes the interesting value from the a previous state action, does something, and then produces a new state action from it. So here we're going to deduct with B. So again, uh, we take an amount to deduct, and we call deduct of that amount. So all that does is builds up this state action that someday we'll run when we're ready. With that state action, so with the deduct state action, we then say, OK, when this thing someday runs, take the account, the, the new account that comes out of it that, that maybe had some money deducted from it. Take that account, and let's build a new state out of that. So our new state says, uh, we, oh, gosh, sorry, <laughs> I totally misspoke. Um, y is not account. Y is the amount deducted. So, sorry, let me, let me rewind. Uh, so we say deductive x, so that builds this uh, new state action that knows how to deduct. And then we say, okay, given y, which is the amount deducted, so that's either the amount that was deducted or the zero that was kind of ugly and C-like. Um, so given the amount deducted, which we're calling y, let's build a new state action that uh, once we're given the account, uh, we will uh, charge a fee. So we'll say, okay, the amount deducted was actually y plus fee. Uh, and then your new account, uh, we're going to tack on that fee as a deduction. As I understand, you're like simulating Bank of America. Even if we didn't deduct, we still take take the fee, right? That's true. Yeah. So even if we don't don't deduct, uh, so if we don't have sufficient funds, you're still going to get a three dollar fee. Um, yeah. It'd be a higher fee if you don't have funds. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's yeah, true. Yeah. Bucks. So we should yeah. maybe we should say if y was zero at, or, or if it was funds. a left, uh, we deduct more than three, just you know, because screw the customer. <laughs> Okay, so all of this together is called the state monad. Um, and this is a, a pretty um, common uh, data structure used when you're describing state in a functional way. Uh, and here's what it looks like, sort of at a minimum, and with a little bit of a Scala twist. So a state monad it is this case class called state where we're encapsulating a run function. And run is just this pure function that says, given an incoming state, I'll give you the out, the, a new state uh, and some value. <coughs> Uh, and then we can map pure functions onto it, so we can convert that uh, interesting value into something. Or we can map uh, these stateful functions where we do something with that interesting value and uh, create a new state action. Uh, and with map and flat map, then we can start using this thing in four comprehensions, which uh, makes this super nice to use, because then we can totally stop thinking about the state uh, of the S. Okay, so before I said that um, this would be safe, composable, and reusable. So let's see how that holds up. So for safety, for the first one, uh, let's define a new function um, called contribute. Uh, so contribute uh, is uh, essentially, it's like deposit, uh, except we're not com computing the, the balance of the account. Uh, so this would be a transaction of unit. Um, it's unit because that A, that, that sort of interesting value that comes out of running this thing is just nothing. We don't care. Um, it's just a black box saying, hey, deposit some money, contribute some money. So contribute is a state action that, given an account, uh, returns nothing interesting and also the account with the contribution. So uh, how is this safe? Well, there's no bars. There's no mutable references, uh, no mutable data structures, uh, assuming that um, this account is an immutable list, which uh, it is based on our type. Um, so remember, this, this operator account colon plus x is not mutating the account variable. It's creating a new list with uh, a new value appended to it. Uh, and so this this action is atomic. There's no, you, you think of it as a single unit. Um, you refer to a, a contribute or a contribution as just this thing. It's, it's this instance of state that you can pass around. Uh, it's atomic at, that's a good question, atomic at what level is the question? It's atomic at the level of 
uh, reasoning about what a contribution is uh, in your code. So in your code, a contribution is an instance of state. And you can use it and reuse it and refer to it as many times as you want. Uh, but it's just a single thing. Sure. <laughs> Uh, and then these are optionally transactional. That's a little bit hand wavy, maybe even more hand wavy than Atomic, um, because there's no transaction code in here. There's no database code in here. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you later how it can be made transactional. So we had safety, composability, and reusability. Uh, on composability, uh, here we have deposit and withdraw, but reworked uh, using four comprehensions. Um, so remember, TX is just a type alias for state. It's a little bit cleaner. So a deposit, which returns a TX of float float, that's a state that return, uh, state that encapsulates a function from list of float to uh, this float float pair and also the new list of floats. And because state has map and a flat map, we can use it in uh, a for comprehension like this. So this says that we're going to call contribute uh, and contribute some money. And when we bind to uh, this invocation, we're binding to that A that's coming out of it. So remember, contribute was a TX of unit, so there's no value coming out of there. So we just kind of ignore this one. Uh, and then we can take this value, which is nothing, and optionally pass it to balance, or just call balance. Uh, balance is itself a state action. So we are binding B to state action of balance, which is the sum of the account. Um, and then we yield a tuple of 0 and B. So this says we're going to contribute uh, funds to the account. Then we're going to check the balance, and we're going to return that, again, 0 here is just kind of a useless placeholder. Maybe it should have been the unit, um, and also the balance. And so you can, this starts to get kind of cool. That, actually, this is sort of the, the first slide where any of this is useful. <laughs> um, it, it's useful here because since we're using four comprehensions, we're in the background using map and flat map. And you can see there's no mention of account anywhere on here. So I didn't have to write any uh, anonymous functions that take an S and return a tuple of whatever an S. Uh, we don't even think about S. We just say, hey, I know this is a state action that somehow works on a an, an account. And I know this is as well. And when I compose them in this way, and I return a transaction of this type, as long as the types uh, are satisfied, <laughs> we can be satisfied that this deposit, uh, invoking deposit here, gives us a single state action that when run will uh, wire all these up together and pass the states along uh, for us. And so this, this is really sweet when you start to use <coughs> lots and lots of these functions and, and use them in different ways and different orders um, because it cleans up your code a lot and, and you, ought, you get for free this, uh, uh, this sort of threading of uh, the, the state going to one action, and then the new state from that action going to the next action, and the new state from that action going to the next action. And so it's, it, it almost looks imperative. So it's actually a way to write imperative looking code, but it's totally functional. Um, and then similarly, withdraw is almost the exact same thing. We call deduct, which remember, deduct returns a transaction of float. So when we bind this w to it, w is that float. It's the amount that was deducted, which we call w for, I guess, withdrawn. Uh, and then we're going to call balance, which itself returns a transaction of float or a state of uh, list of floats of float. Um, and then we bind B to that uh, state action. So we're getting the withdrawn amount from this state action. We're getting the balance from this state action. And remember, this balance will run on the second S, right? So it's the balance of the now, the, the new account after the withdrawal happened or the, the deduction happened. Uh, and then the thing that we were yield is, hey, this much was withdrawn, and by the way, here's your new balance. So it's a transaction of float float. Uh, and if we were to um, expand this out and get rid of our little TX shortcut, this would actually say state of list of float, comma, float float as a tuple. And so again, we can, we can describe a withdraw function um, without ever having to worry about the account, but it's still all buried in there um, in the actual implementation. Don't you need to put semicolons after deduct, after contribute? Uh, no, you don't need semicolons here. They're inferred from the carriage return. Um, I, if I wanted to put this all in one line, I think I would need semicolons. 
Oh, I, you know what you're thinking of? If you use a four with parentheses, um, it can't, it, it doesn't have that semicolon inference. So, yeah, it's sort of kind of a convenient practice. I just never use parentheses with my four so expressions. Four with curly Thank you. Thank you. I, I mean, it's just a it's just a detail of the Scala compiler and how it parses. So big state actions. If we were to have something like, I want to deposit and then make a withdrawal and then make another deposit and make another withdrawal, all of this like in a chain, uh, we can decompose those into these functions. And and nowhere in this decomposition do we run into what we had before, where we have lots of functions that all know about this mutable account and are all potentially mutating it at the same time. In fact, it's impossible for them to mutate it at the same time because uh, balance here just physically cannot run until contribute has run and produced an S on which this balance can be uh, invoked. Yeah. Could you please uh, revisit withdraw and uh, yeah. tell me about no blend? I'm right here, right on the same slide. Where is map and flat map? Is called, and mm -hmm. how is that choice determined? Yeah, so this would get desugared into deductive x dot flat map, and then curly brace, w, and then a fat right arrow, uh, and then balance of w. Uh, and then after that, dot, so after the curly brace, dot map uh, b fat arrow, and then in parentheses wb. Lost you somewhere, but in uh, it will look like this. Yes. So it would look deduct of x flat map of uh, w injected into balance of w. <coughs> so that. And then dot map. Uh, sorry, I'm running out of space. Uh, B, and then we just return W and B like this. So that's how it would get the sugar. Can you see that? Yeah. Oh, I don't know why I just didn't do that. like that. Uh, so what happens is the Scala compiler, basically anytime it sees a, a left arrow, it turns that into a flat map. Um, and then the rest of the code, or, let me get rid of this. Um, the rest of the, comp so let's say we're here. Uh, so we'll, the deduct will be called and then this arrow is turned into a flat map. And then the rest of the code, which is this W and this B and this balance, turns into a function where W is the input and the rest of the code is the output. And so since there's another arrow, Scala will desugar that into another flat map. And then finally, after that whole thing is done, to get the yield, there's one final call to map. And that's just sort of how the Scala compiler um, desugars any uh, for comprehension. Um, by the way, there's a, uh, there's a course on Coursera taught by Martin Odersky. It's called Functional Programming, Introduction to Functional Programming or something like that. Does anyone know what it's called? Yeah, exactly. Functional programming in Scala. Uh, so that in, in that course, uh, one of the things he does is step by step show you how the four comprehension is desugared, which is really helpful um, for understanding that. Uh, nowhere in here are we using map. If if I had another line in here that said foo equals w times two, the equals gets desugared into a map um, because it's not dependent on any state. It's just a pure function that's operating on this w. I might have an example of that. We'll see. So that's composability. So finally, reusability. Uh, we've kind of sort of implicitly covered this already. Um, but when we, let me go back one slide. When we make all these functions that return state actions for us, we can um, combine them in, in lots of different ways. So we can reuse deposit and withdraw here to make a bigger function, deposit and withdraw. And so all it does is it runs deposit. And remember, de deposit is. Um, all of this code, it's simply a single instance of state. So it's a state action. So we, we pass an amount to that state action. Uh, it will run. It will do the deposit. Uh, and then its result, I think, was a zero. What was its result? I already forgot. Its result is a zero and the new balance after uh, contrib uh, contributing money. 
so that its type is here. Uh, and so uh, we don't really care about that zero, it's not useful to us. Um, and then we withdraw an amount uh, that was passed into this function. And I probably shouldn't have reused w because it's a little confusing, but we, <laughs> we make a new uh, w uh, that binds to uh, here. So, the, uh, sorry, actually, I think I might have an error here. Oh, no, 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 we're good. So uh, it binds to the output of uh, this withdraw and then yields that. So I shouldn't have called it w, that's really confusing. Um, this withdraw function is yielding a tuple as its a. So I, calling it w here is a little confusing because it's actually w and b. Uh, so we're yielding w and b, the exact same tuple that came out of withdraw. So we can compose these things in different ways. We can reuse them. And at no point do we need to worry about um, which order things are happening or if things will be mutating state at the same time. Um, or um, uh, there's one more point I was going to make. Ah, yeah, so we, we, as I said, we don't have to worry about uh, writing this code in terms of this state that's being threaded through our system. Okay, so uh, how do we make it go? Let's say we've got, uh, I, write, I run this code, I run deposit then withdraw, and I give it two inputs. Uh, all it returns to me is a, a transaction. All it returns is an instance of the state case class. So that's not that useful to me. I, like I haven't actually deposited or withdrawn anything. So how do I make it go? Well, we need to call the run function. But to call the run function, we have to give it an account on which to run this deposit and then withdraw. <coughs> Uh, so here's what a run function might look like. Uh, its type is kind of noisy. But this says, if you give me a transaction that returns this float float tuple, I will run uh, that state action. I will run that transaction. Um, and I will return to you this really big type where uh, we've got the float float tuple that that state action was going to produce. And also, I'll give you the state just for free, so the outcoming state of this thing. And uh, so here's a little bit of pseudocode. If we have a database where um, we've got transaction management, here we could begin a transaction. Then we could somehow get the account from the database. Remember, account is just our list of floats. Uh, and then once we've got our account, we, uh, we call the run function of x. Remember, x is just a state action, so it's got a run uh, property inside of it. So we run, uh, we run that action with our account. So now we've actually run the entire thing, and the output is some, some outputs, this tuple thing, uh, and then also a new account. So we can extract all of that uh, using this syntax here. So uh, when we run this thing, we get uh, a w and a b for some arbitrary w and b, uh, and then the new account. So this account that has been potentially changed by running this state action. Uh, so, uh, th so now we've got a new account. We update it in the database, potentially. Uh, and then we're happy, no errors have happened, so we can commit our transaction. Uh, and then probably the person who called this function is interested in what actually happened, so we finally return uh, the same thing that, that came out of running this action. So it's just a coincidence that I called this run and that the state has a property called run. Uh, this could have been called uh, run this transaction, or you know, actually, more more realistically, since this is so. Uh, actually, you you caught me. I got ahead of myself. Uh, this is a very specific implementation of uh, an interpreter, where we know we've got a database that has transactions. We know our database can get and update accounts. So we've got a way to interact with uh, our actual state. So at this point, we're ha we have state mutation, right? We're, we're getting from a database, and we're updating to a database. Um, so this interpreter uh, that I've maybe uh, um, uh, inconveniently called run uh, sh is, is really the, the database version of how to run a state action. Uh, and so you could, you could write an interpreter using whatever your data model is. Maybe your account is just a var that's in memory. Um, in that case, uh, your, your run function would pass that var into here, get the new account, and then update the var with the new account. Um, the, the point is that this function knows how to uh, do some state manipulation, um, some actual 
side effect. So this function is definitely not referentially transparent, but everything else that we've seen is. Um, but yeah, uh, in, in short, it's a coincidence that they called them both runs. I'm just not creative enough. Okay, so some of the problems that uh, that you run into with this pattern um, is, uh, well, so we haven't really seen this, um, uh, but I, I'll, I'll describe it. But synchronizing access to mutable references. So I said that this is a an interpreter for a database, maybe a uh, MySQL database that has transactions. Uh, but you might write a similar interpreter that knows how to change a VAR reference, maybe that original VAR account that we had at the beginning. Uh, the, the point is we still have some mutable data or mutable references, and it's possible that many people could be calling this run function uh, if we don't control access to it carefully. Uh, so we still have our original problem of many people are accessing the same mutable data uh, simultaneously. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, and then another problem is wrapping state actions and transactions, which I actually already solved here and didn't update the slide. So uh, strike that one out. Uh, so in general, th there's no sort of magic uh, silver bullet. We, we can't completely escape mutability. Uh, we've always got a database that has data that can be changed, or we've got um, a log file that's being appended to, or a screen that's being printed to, or there's some kind of state. Um, but the idea is if we can push all of the, or as much as possible, of the manipulation of that state or those side effects to the outer edge of our program, we can write the rest of our program such that it's completely functional and completely uh, stateless um, and referentially transparent. Uh, and then somewhere at the very outer edge of our program, we have a function that, that can take that pure description of a program and run it in some way that actually does the mutation of our state. Um, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with Java servlets? Java servlets. Great. Okay, so a, a fair amount. You could imagine uh, if you were if you wanted to write a pure version of a web application using a servlet, uh, that outer edge of your program might be the servlet.service method, and so your your service method knows how to get to <laughs> the database potentially, or it knows how to change session data, things like that. But all of the code that it calls is just these, simply these state actions. Um, and they're composed and in, 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 um, put together in some way that describes the business logic. Um, but they themselves do not actually make any changes happen. It, that has to be invoked from a, an interpreter like this that would be in that service function. Or if you had a, uh, just a static main method, that, that would be where, uh, that would be this outer edge that I'm um, clumsily trying to describe. Uh, well, so mutability in a servlet does matter in terms of the, the code that your servlet is calling. So you could still have the same problem with variables and state changes and things. And actually with a servlet, you might have many invocations of that service happening at the same time. So it, it's still something to, um, to worry about, for sure. Say again? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and actually, with the servlet case, um, so you generally you have one thread per invocation of service. So within that thread, you maybe don't have state issues to worry about uh, if you use this pattern. Um, but maybe between threads, you do. So if you have multiple requests, is that what you're getting at? What I'm trying to say is that uh, I think the support to the example of the server is not correct because in the server case, we write the uh, uh, so is important, but uh, nobody cares much about the uh, I see. So I, I disagree. I think people do care about mutability, uh, even in, in just a single invocation. Say again? From compiler design. <clears throat> Maybe not from compiler design point of view, but certainly any business logic that a servlet would call 
um, could still have all of these problems with. What's my take on what? Uh, I'm not familiar. Um, can you spell that? Uh, Grails. 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 Oh, Grails. Um, I have no experience with it. So how does the steam steam So in this pattern, scalability is. Uh, still a little bit outside of uh, the scope of, of this, what we've described. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's an answer to how does Scala handle scalability because it's just like Java; it's just a language. So you know, you can do, uh, you can do all the evil mutation that you want. It's, That's okay. So the question is in a servlet uh, environment, uh, if you're interacting with a session that is that's local to the servlet container on some box somewhere, and if you're scaling out and you have many servlet containers, that right. Um, so this doesn't really address that. Uh, in that case, I would say don't use the session. Use something else that's pushed to a lower level that all of the servers can access. Um, or you can have some kind of crazy session replication or something, but but e either way, that's that's sort of orthogonal to. Um, this so in example. that sense, Scala does not have too much improvement over Java. So Scala's that's true. In in those terms, Scala does not have um, improvement over Java, but that's not. I mean, Scala is a programming language, so I think when 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 someone describes Scala as scalable, what they mean is more the language rather than the runtime, I suspect. I just wanted to say, I mean, some of the patterns you see here make programming asynchronously really, really nice. Um, so uh, doing you know, virtual service and that sort of thing. And when some people the play play, I think it's common way people do that. That makes this, this makes it a lot, lot nicer to work with than say, no, there's something we've got callback how it works against the callbacks. The pattern you see with the for notation works yeah, really well with futures and sequencing uh, asynchronous actions. So I think that's the way most people are addressing scalability. But in terms of asynchronous operations, they are basically stateless. If you want to go stateful, you have to do things. It's like a handshake, because you are waiting. <laughs> sure, yeah, I buy that. So most of us are the operation as they Yep, yeah, I think this is more of a pattern for when you have synchronous, in the way you've described it, synchronous functions <coughs> and you need to thread them together. Yeah. Uh, this lets you do that in a way that um, is still safe to use and also conveniently hides the thing that you're actually threading. Um, so here's, I'm not sure if this is going to work, I'm give it a try, but it's also really unreadable. Um, but this is something, there's no libraries here, so you can just paste this right into your REPL. Okay, so here's state, uh, exactly as we described it in the slides, so we wrap a run function and we define map and flat map, no changes there. Uh, here's just a convenience function uh, to uh, build a state action. Um, so we say, uh, given, it, so here's a run function where we're locking down S to be list of float, uh, just for convenience. Okay, and now we're going to build up an action out of a bunch of little actions. So we're going to say, okay, let's make a transaction where we take an account and we, uh, we add 100 to that account. And then we don't really return anything anything interesting. So then we we are, there's an underscore here, so we're not binding. Uh, but if this were like a an, 
a a would be unit um, because that's what this transaction is returning in addition to the state. Uh, and then we're saying, okay, x is just 20. And so what we've seen already uh, behind the scenes are a, a flat map and a map. And then we're saying w is another transaction. It's another state action that says, okay, when I get an account, I'm going to do this same logic that we saw before. So if the balance of the account is sufficient, we will make a withdrawal and then return the amount withdrawn. Otherwise, we do not make a withdrawal and we just return nothing. Nothing was withdrawn. So w will be either this x or it will be 0 depending on the balance of the account. Uh, and then finally we say b is bound to this uh, or extracted from this transaction that takes an account and computes the sum of that account or, or the balance of the account and then just passes the account through unchanged. Uh, and so these are all put into this for comprehension and at the end of it we yield w and b. So we have three separate uh, state actions defined here. They're all wired up together. The state is passed from one to the next to the next. And then at the very end of it, we will return from our state action, we will return the amount withdrawn, which might be zero, and then the final balance of the account after that withdrawal happened. Uh, and so then, so action is now, this action is an instance of state. So it has a run function inside of it. And we can invoke that function like this and pass it nil. So nil is our initial account. It's just an empty uh, account with no money in it. And so all of this stuff runs, right? So we add 100 bucks to the account. We set x to equal 20, not very interesting. Then we check, hey, is the sum of the account, which is 100, greater than or equal to 20? Yep. OK. Let's return that 20 and deduct 20 from the account. Finally, uh, we'll take the account, check the sum, so we'd expect it to be 80, uh, and pass the account through. And so when we run this whole thing, we should, we should expect three pieces of data. We should expect this W and this V, and then the final account that has had all these um, transactions run on it. And so when we run it, the output looks like this, which hopefully you can see in the back. Uh, but it says the amount withdrawn was 20, the remaining balance is 80, and here's the state of your account. So your account is a deposit of 100 and a withdrawal of 20. Uh, and so all of that happened, um, computing all of this data happened uh, on this last line when we ran the action. Uh, and you know maybe somewhere else in our code we could refer to this action and use it for other things if this particular <coughs> thing would have, um, <coughs> useful to us. That's all I got. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So even in real world, all of those actions could be some complicated, right? Mm -hmm. And you would not like have them on one place. Mm -hmm. and oh right, yeah. So for this demo, these yeah. are really simple, just yeah. so they fit in the yeah. And so you do a bunch of stuff, and usually you want to log something mm -hmm. in those uh, functions. Yep. And how you can do the logging? Because in mm -hmm. the imperative style, you just all the right. logging statement, right. blocks, and you're good to go. Here, if you want to do that logging, the logging is actually uh, breaks this uh, referential transparency, yep. and you have to kind of do it that way. What's the... Yep. So the, the problem is, if we wanted to add some logging to this, maybe we'd want to log at this point that this transaction completed, and log at this point that the withdrawal didn't finish because it was a zero or did finish or whatever. If, so if we added like a log.info or a print lin or whatever inside of here, we, we could do this because uh, it's Scala and it lets us do whatever we want. But then this this action value is not referentially transparent. We, we can't, every time we uh, start composing this thing in other places, we're going to have lots of side effects changing our log. So if you want to be completely pure and and disallow this, uh, you would capture your log in almost the same way. Uh, just like with state, we're threading this state through. You would have a similar thing where you're threading your log through and describing how to add to that log and produce a new log that has an additional message. Um, and that works totally fine. Uh, it starts to get really tricky, though, because now you've got one kind of state that's dealing with accounts and another kind of state that's dealing with logs. So your type is like state of uh, state of whatever, of whatever, of whatever. So it's like this really nested, confusing thing. Um, but it is doable. 
uh, in practice. Why, why, why don't you use, for example, you can modify the state and just add the monoid or something to that state? That's true. You can just add to that state and... Partition is probably closer. Yeah. So right. So, uh, or you could come up with a way, if you know that you're always going to have logs and accounts at the same time, or at least you have a subset of functions that have that, yeah, your, your S is no longer a list of float. It's a list of float and also a list of string or you know some other type that's capturing your log. Um, or you can have, uh, or you can just put in your log statements and say whatever were functional enough. Um, it's you know it depends on um, on really what you're going for. Um, I think that's that's probably one of the more desirable um, approaches. Uh, you wouldn't be able to use this TX type alias because your S is now sometimes you have one kind of S and other times you have other kinds of S. Uh, and then that starts to get tricky when you're building up full comprehensions, but um, it's it's definitely doable. Cool. Well, thanks for your time. I I, I really hope there's um, there's a few more examples that I can uh, refer you to. This is uh, I, I can't stress enough how useful this has been uh, in practice. Uh, this has made it able made our team able to. Um, independently work on lots and lots of code without ever worrying about um, are we are there side effects or are we changing the state that we didn't realize? It's all encoded very strictly into the pipe. Um, so yeah, feel free to ping me with questions afterward. Can I ask you what that's all? Yeah, sure. What's the update on Go? I do. So Go, I, I have not used Go. Um, I got as far as its kind of limited type system and decided I wasn't interested. What's your opinion about ISIS? <laughs> <laughs> My opinion about ISIS? Please, no, what, what is this, Miss America? Just kidding, Either way, we are not talking about this. <laughs> just kidding, you look like we are doing really awesome. No, I don't know, no, they might watch this video, no. I don't want them to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they use Not a drug, not a bit tough. Thank you. Do you think we are done? We have one more talk.